Good morning. Merry Christmas. We got just a couple more days. I hope you guys are hanging tight, getting ready for what you, you've got coming. Um, I still have quite a bit of wrapping to do, pretty much all my wrapping to do, but we'll get it done. We'll get it done. There might not be as much sleep the next couple of days as I would hope, but that's okay. I hope for the next couple of minutes, you, with all the things you've got swirling in your mind, can take some time to just sit and absorb and think about why we are celebrating Christmas, why we have this season, because it really is a wonder and a miracle upon miracles that we have a God who loves us so much that he came in the form of a baby and grew up to be a man to come and die and save us from our sins and to rise again. And so that's really why we're celebrating. So this morning we are going to be in Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles or a device, um, you can, we're going to be like pretty much there the whole time. So you can look up Luke chapter 2, verse 22. We're going to start there. We're going to be looking at an event that happened quickly or like soon after Jesus was born. And it, it's not, you know, a part of the, the Christmas story necessarily, but it points to some powerful things that we can take away about Jesus coming and about his birth. And so we're going to start in chapter 2. We're going to look at a guy named Simeon who uh, had been promised by God that he would see the Messiah before he died. And we're going to find Jesus and his parents coming to the temple, taking part in one of three ceremonies that all Jewish families, faithful Jewish families, would take part in after a baby was born. There were three different ceremonies, and they would go to the temple, and they would do different things for each ceremony. And this one in particular was the time that they were coming and bringing a sacrifice. And on this particular day, God intercepts these two groups of people, Simeon and then later Anna, which we won't talk about today, which is fascinating, and you can keep reading in Luke to find out about Anna. But they're going, we're going to interact between Anna and Jesus and Mary and Joseph. So we're going to start, we're going to just dive right in, verse 22. It says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now we're going to stop there for a second. Really, in the law of Moses, the original plan is that it, the, a couple who have a baby are to present the baby to the Lord and offer a lamb for a burnt sacrifice and a pigeon or a turtle dove for uh, the sin offering. But what we see here is they bring two uh, turtle doves. And the reason they do that is because we wanted to be able to sing the 12 Days of Christmas later on. Not really. Um, I don't, uh, I know there's like some lineup for all that. But anyway, uh, no, the reason they brought that instead of the lamb was because God had given a provision in the law that anyone who couldn't afford a lamb could bring two pigeons or two turtle doves instead of the lamb and then one of the birds. And so they came forward with these two pigeons, which shows us that not only did God push himself and squeeze himself into the body of this little baby, but he also chose to come to a family that if they lived today would have been under government assistance. He came to a family that was humble and um, not wealthy, not full of all the luxuries of that day. All right, verse 25, it says, Now there is a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So there's this guy, Simeon, the scriptures say that he's righteous and devout. Now, how I always try to remember the word righteous means in right standing with God. So he was a holy man, someone who lived well, lived right, and lived according to the law. And it, in this Greek word for devout means that he was very intentional. It wasn't that he was just good. You know, he was very thoughtful and, and intentional about his faith. And so he was well respected from the people around him. And he had been waiting, what it says, for the consolation of Israel. Now, if you remember, the Jews had been waiting for centuries for a Messiah to come. 
They wanted a king like King David to come from the line of King David that would right all the wrongs that had gone wrong for the, for the nation of Israel. And during this particular time in history, the Romans were in control. This was during the spread of the Roman Empire. And so the Romans were in control of this particular area and they were over the Israelites. And so the, the longing for a Messiah was even stronger than before because they were oppressed during this time and they were governed by, by people they didn't agree with and people they didn't want to be ruled by. And so people were longing for this king to come who would, who would restore Israel to its rightful standing with God and then in the world among people. So... Here we are, we see that the Holy Spirit somehow lets Simeon know that before he dies, he's going to get to see the long-awaited Messiah. And in the short view, you know, we look at this and we see, yes, the Jewish people, they wanted this, this Messiah to come and, 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 and change the political climate. But there was a longer waiting that was going on here, even more than that. Simeon is an example, a good example of the waiting that the Jewish people took part in. You know, it, it's, it's easy for us to look at the scripture and kind of read it quickly and not think about how this all played out. But technically, a spiritual Messiah, a savior who would bring the world into right standing with God forever, had been waited for since Adam and Eve were banished in the garden. You know, from that point on, Adam and Eve, they chose to disobey God and God punished them and banished them from the garden. But then he also said to them, from your offspring, there will come someone who will crush the devil for what he has done. And so since Adam and Eve, they had been waiting for a Messiah. They had been waiting for someone to come and fix everything that got messed up. And so Simeon is at this pinnacle point where he has been longing and waiting. And we don't know how long the promise was. Like, we don't know when God told him that he would see the Messiah. We don't know if it was a week. We don't know if it was 20 years, 40 years, 80 years before. We don't know. But what we know is that he had been longing. He was righteous. He was devout. And he was waiting for the Messiah. And he hadn't given up hope. For thousands of years... Creation had waited. And then for 400 years before Jesus was born, there was this silence where God didn't give, didn't speak any prophecies. There were no prophecies written down. There was no direction from the Lord. So Simeon didn't have any recent, you know, prophecies to be encouraged by. And, and he didn't have any recent events to be excited by signs of. I mean, he, he, all he looked around and he saw these Romans, just these Gentiles taking over the, the land in the area, but he was holding on to the promises of God. And I think that for many of us, we know how hard it is to hold on to the promises of God. We know what it feels like to wait. You know, I mean, for 2,000 years, we've heard about Jesus. We've heard that he was born and, and that he lived and he died and he rose again and that he's going to come back. And for 2,000 years, we've, we've, we've heard these stories and, and, and all, of, all of the world who's, who's, who's heard of Christianity and heard of Jesus have been waiting. And sometimes he just feels, feels really far off. And sometimes the waiting just, you look around in the current situation, it feels a lot like the Jewish people in their time. In the current political situation or the current cultural situation makes you think, really? Is all this true? Is he really going to come back? Was there really a Jesus? And is he really going to do what he said he's going to do? And then I know for some of us, it's not just a waiting for like that big spiritual moment, but it's a very personal waiting for something that's going on in your life or something that, that, that you're waiting for in particular. You know, I, um, because of my job, I get to see all the prayer requests week in and week out. And I see what you are all waiting for. There are so many of us in this room who are waiting for something. And you're waiting for good things. I mean, there are people in this room who are waiting for marriages to be restored. Or, or waiting for a loved one to finally get clean for good. Or waiting for a pregnancy test to be positive. Or for a healing from a chronic pain or, or disease. Some of you are, are waiting for, for restored relationships or for a spouse to walk through life with. Many of you are grieving today 
and you're waiting for the pain to subside just a little bit. And in that waiting, it can get hard. And I want to encourage you with something. Because what we see is, we, we look at this, and just as we quickly read through, we see that Simeon waited. And then we're reminded in his waiting that Israel waited. But God waited the whole time too. He was waiting along with them the whole time too. And he's waiting with you. You know, if you think about it, from the fall, from the time when Adam and Eve disobeyed in the garden, you know, God had created, given them the world. He'd given them everything they had ever wanted so that he could have a relationship with them and love them and they could love him. And then they turned their backs on him and then he started to wait. When? He waited to, he, he's waiting and waiting for that time when finally creation will be restored to what it was designed to be. You know, he waited a hundred years until Abraham had Isaac. He waited 400 years while the Egyptians had to prepare themselves to get ready to be, to be freed from slavery in Egypt. He waited for them in the, through the 40 days in the desert, or 40 years in the desert. He waited while they went through their kings and their judges and their prophets. He waited for the 400 years of silence before Jesus. God waited that whole time too. And do you know that the time Jesus came was perfect for him to come? You know, looking back from a historical perspective, when you think about the, the climate and, uh, you know, political climate and the way that the empire, the Roman Empire had kind of positioned itself, the time was perfect for the gospel to come to the world. Because at that time, the Jewish people were primed and ready and longing for their Messiah, and at the same time, because of the way that the, the Romans were working and conquering, the road system of the known world was better than it had ever been. And the assimilation process of the conquered people of the Romans was so good that the gospel was able to spread in a way that it never would have been able to spread before. And God knew the perfect time for Jesus to be born. And he knows the perfect time for whatever it is you're waiting for. He knows what's best. And the thing is, is what we see here is that God loves us. He loves you. And he is patient because he has a perspective that we don't have. He didn't have to give Simeon this opportunity in this moment to meet the Messiah. He didn't even have to give us the Messiah. But he cares about us. And he waits with us. And do you know, every day when you wake up, God has another opportunity to do something. He's not done with your story. The God who, who put the star in the sky to guide the kings, and the, and, and the, and the God who, who was able to make a virgin pregnant, and the God who, who put angels in the sky to sing, and brought shepherds to Mary, and arranged a meeting between Simeon and, and Jesus and his parents, that same God is your God. And he is God over your situations and God over your relationships and God over everything that you worry about and struggle with. And this God is a God who can do immeasurably more than you hope for or imagine. And all of that included is the fact that he loves you more than you can imagine. And what's amazing about my job and what I love about my job is that, yes, I see all the prayer requests, but I also see all the praise reports. And I see all the lives that ch get changed. And I can point to people in this room who have had their marriages restored. Many. I can, I can name people who have been chemical-free from addiction for decades I can tell you people whose spouses they prayed for for years to come to Christ and they came to Christ. I can tell you of miraculous healings. I can tell you of people who have grieved major losses who can now belly laugh without fear, feeling weird about it. I can tell you about marriages that were long awaited and are so now worth the wait. God is not finished with your story yet. Every day you wake up and have breath, he has opportunity for a new part of your story. He sees you. 
He loves you, and he knows your desires. The other thing that is, that is really interesting about this part of Scripture is the fact that the Holy Spirit is speaking to Simeon. Now, we can just overlook that and keep going because, yeah, the Holy Spirit, yeah, he comes, he talks, but, you know, we, we see this in the Bible. But up until this point in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only kind of came to the big dogs of faith. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, um, and all the prophets that the, that the books in the Bible are named after. But at this point in history, we see an uptick in the Holy Spirit's interaction with people. And this is particularly exciting because for 400 years, God had been silent. But when we see the, the Christmas story, we see the Holy Spirit all over the place. You know, first, of course, he, he, um, Mary conceives a baby by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then she goes and she talks to Elizabeth. Before she says a word to Elizabeth, her cousin, she, Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit and knows that Mary is carrying the Messiah. And then it says that John the Baptist, when he was born, he was filled with the Spirit from that point on. And Zechariah, John's father, was filled with the Spirit and sang a song of praise. And now we see Simeon. You see, God is up to something new here. And his spirit is moving and working. So in verse 27, it says, Moved by the spirit, he went into the temple courts. Now, we don't know how Simeon heard the spirit. We don't know if it was like an audible voice or an impression or a thought or a dream. We have no idea. All we know is that Simeon heard and he obeyed. In verse 27, it says, When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now, this blessing is actually famous. It has a name. It's called Nuke Dimitis, which means the Song of Simeon. And it has been chanted in worship services for hundreds of years. And it's a beautiful section of Scripture. It's a beautiful blessing, full of hope. It's a realization of promises fulfilled. I mean, in one fell swoop, Simeon is saying Jesus is God's salvation. He's his light. He's his glory. And he also points to the fact that the Messiah is not just for the Jews, but the Messiah is for all people. You know, Gentiles, that's any non-Jew, that's anybody who was not Jewish. And here, this pious, devout Jew is saying that the Messiah is for everybody. Now, at the time, this would have been a little bit unusual because the Jews particularly thought that they were the chosen people of God and that God was going to save them. But if you look in Scripture and in the prophecies in the Old Testament, it's clear that the Messiah was for all people. It just wasn't the usual thought of the day at the time. But Simeon confirms the fact that the Messiah was for everyone. It says then in verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. I mean, if you think about it, just for a minute, think about being Mary and Joseph. I mean, at every turn, they had to be like, what? Oh my goodness. I mean, really, like everything is so amazing. You know, you get the angel coming to Mary and then Joseph doubts the whole thing. And then the angel goes to Joseph and then she starts growing this baby in her womb. And then she goes and sees Elizabeth and Elizabeth knows without her even saying anything. And, and then the, the shepherds come as, as she gives birth to the baby and they saw angels. I mean, it's just confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. And now you have Simeon. I mean, the word marveled here has got to be the perfect word for that. They had to just literally be like, oh, again, just amazing. But then Simeon turns to Mary and says this. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now I can just imagine the chill that went down Mary's spine. I mean, what about all the peace talk? What about the tidings of great joy? And the angel saying, don't be afraid. And now you're telling me this? What's this with the rising and falling of people and sword piercing my soul? I mean, I would wonder if Mary maybe at that moment was like, oh, he's just a crazy old man. I'm just, I don't want to take any of that in. 
I mean, think about that. Or maybe, maybe Mary completely got it. You know, she'd already been through a considerable amount of pain. Joseph almost left her. You know people's opinion about her had to be tarnished because they weren't going to believe that really she was impregnated by God. But I would think that Mary and Joseph would have, yes, they recognized that they went through pain, but I would think that they would hope that the worst part was over. You know, now they're married, the baby's born, he's cute, the grandparents are going to love him, you know, we're just going to move on. And this guy says, no, this is going to be painful. This is going to hurt. You know, I would think that for Mary and Joseph, these would be words that they wanted to forget. But it's obvious that Mary didn't forget these words because she most likely was the person who told Luke all of this information for her, him to put in the Gospel of Luke. And I wonder, as, as, as Mary lived her life and watched Jesus and watched him grow and watched his ministry, if there were times where she was reminded of Simeon's words again. Because there were times where Mary wanted Jesus to do certain things and he didn't do them. You know, we always think about the story where Mary says, oh, go make the water into wine, and he goes and he obeys. But there are other times where Mary says, come, and he doesn't come. And there are times where he does things she doesn't want him to do. And there are times where she watches all these people in authority get ticked off at her son, and she's just watching him stir. And you got to think, she's got to think about these scriptures and say, ugh. This is a sword piercing my soul to watch my son go through this, even before he dies on the cross. And I think, again, like we can relate to Simeon waiting, we can relate to Mary here. There are times when we're just not going to get what God is doing. And there are times where we're going to want him to do something he's not going to do, or he's going to want us to do something we're not going to want to do. And there are times when we are going to struggle and we're going to go through pain. And, you know, we, we, we come to church and we hear hope, love, peace, all this wonderful stuff. And we absorb that all in and we love that. But we know and we hear week in and week out that there is also a struggle that comes with our faith. There is a conflict. There is a pain, a sword that pierces our souls at times as we, as, we, as we live out our faith. You know, it's fun to take in all the peace, love, and hope stuff. But there are hard truths that come with all this. You know, there are truths that say that we are to die to ourselves, that we are to submit to others, that we are to put others above ourselves, that we're to love our enemies and forgive others and, and be generous. And, and, and Jesus says that in this life we'll have trouble. And all these truths, these hard truths that we have to take in, just like Mary and Joseph had to take in the good and the hard in Simeon's blessing, we also need to take in the good and the hard that comes with our faith. But we know, many of us know, who've walked out this faith for a while, that it is through the hard things that we find the peace of God. And it is through the hard things that we grow in our faith. I remember when I was eight or nine, I don't know, a kid, and I was riding my, my bike out back. I had a, a sky blue bike with with the white banana seat you know remember those and then I had the blue ribbons coming out of the handlebars it was very nice it was a hand-me-down but it was very nice and I was riding out back and we had this alleyway where all the neighborhood kids would ride but they put gravel on the alley and you know gravel is not really that great for bike riding and I was trying to show off because all the kids my age were boys and I needed to prove that I was just as good as the boys but in this instance, I obviously was not as good as the boys because I wrecked and I landed on my knee. And my mom wasn't home, but the neighbor was watching us and she was kind and nice and she was also a nurse. So I came to her bawling, my knee is gashed up, you know, just a mess. And so she lifts me up on the counter and she takes a look. And my knee was like this combination of blood and flesh and gravel and dirt. And she had to fix it. But she knew she couldn't just bandage it up. And so she had to slowly and painfully and carefully get out all the dirt and all the impurities so that it could heal properly. And this is how it is in our faith. That we've got all this junk in us and around us and through us. 
And sometimes it's a slow, painful process to clean out all that junk so that we can be healed, so that we can be made as we were supposed to be, so that we can be in right standing with God. And it's hard, and it's painful, and there's this conflict, but there is spiritual growth that comes in pain. We know, we can hold on to the fact that much of our faith building will be after walking through hard times, or like Simeon, waiting for something we want. So Simeon spoke truth in both of his statements, that Jesus would be our salvation, and he would be a light to the Gentiles, but he would also bring conflict and pain. You know, the truth of the gospel is that everybody gets to make the decision. Jesus offers himself as a gift to everyone, and we get to decide, are we going to follow him or are we going to say no? And what happens as a result is there's two groups. It's just a natural consequence, those who agree and follow Jesus and those who do not. And there becomes this natural conflict between the two groups. And those of you who have loved ones who don't fall in the same line of where you fall in faith in Jesus, you know you've got this conflict with them. And sometimes it's okay, but sometimes it's really hard. And there, most of us in this room have not been disowned or been persecuted for our faith, although there are many in the world who have. But I would bet that there are, I would bet the majority of us in this room who've lived out our faith have experienced at one time or another some kind of rejection or misunderstanding or a dismissive attitude or being excluded for our faith. And it hurts. Some of us have fractured relationships because of where we stand with Jesus. And it's hard. You know, Scripture tells us that people love the darkness because when they go into the light, their true self is revealed. And so when we live out our faith, the natural consequences is that we shine light. And that can be unsettling for the people around us. Timothy Keller describes it this way. He says, you don't have to be Jesus Christ to get people furious at being exposed for what they are. Just living an honest, moral life will expose gossip in the office, corruption in government, racism in the neighborhood. Everything about his life says to us, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. No one wants to hear that. It's not surprising that they get mad at him. If you identify with Jesus and you don't hide your connection, some people will get mad at you too. It's true. If we're going to live out our faith, there will, unfortunately, be conflict. And it hurts. And not only is there conflict between people, but Jesus also can create conflict. He does inside of us. You know, it's that initial conflict that happens when we're deciding what are we going to do with Jesus. It's kind of this wrestling. If I'm going, am I going to put my faith in him? Am I going to believe it or am I not? So there's that initial internal in, um, conflict. But then there's the conflict that comes after that. When you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to live this way. And then you're struggling with this flesh, sinful side of you. It's like inside, you know, Jekyll and Hyde fighting back and forth. And there are times where, where we're not going to understand what God's plan is. We're not going to understand what's going on. And all of that just can stir up a conflict inside of us. Times where God's going to say, no, you've got to forgive that person. And you don't want to forgive that person. Or no, you need to submit. Or you need to love. Or you need to extend grace. Or you need to wait. Or whatever it is. And it causes this conflict inside of us. There's a, there was an Anglican bishop, long gone now, but in the 1800s, his name was J.C. Ryle, and he explained it this way. He said, the child of God has two great marks about him. He may be known by his inward warfare as well as his inward peace. There are thousands of men and women who go to churches and chapels every Sunday and call themselves Christians. They are ma married in Christian marriage services. They are buried as Christians when they die. But you never see any fight about their religion. Or spir of spiritual strife and exertion and conflict and self-denial, watching and warring, they know literally nothing at all. Such Christianity is not the Christianity of the Bible. It is not the religion which the Lord Jesus founded and his apostles preached. True Christianity is a fight. And it's a fight internal. 
It's this internal fight between the flesh and sin inside of us and the part of us that wants to follow God, that wants to do what he wants us to do. We are, like everybody else, instinctively drawn to the darkness and not to the light. And so in order to fight against that inertia, it is a conflict within us. The book of Romans talks about this internal fight. You know, we all experience it. It, You know, it's one of those things, like, for example, we say, I'm not going to get involved with the workplace gossip. I'm not going to get, you know, say anything. And then you go into work, and the next thing you know is you're deep in the middle of it. Or, or you, you've committed, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes anymore. I'm going to throw away the pack. And then two weeks later, you're on smoke break with everybody else at, at work. Or, or maybe um, you, you've decided, I'm going to stay pure in my relationship with my boyfriend or my go- girlfriend. But the next thing you know is you've gone further than you committed to go. Or you say, I don't want to yell at my kids anymore. I don't want to snap at my husband and have that tone with my husband. And then you turn around and, and, and you've done it. Again. Romans 7 in the message paraphrase says, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to be bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets, be- it gets the better of me every time. And you know, we all struggle with this. The truth is, and the hope is, that the closer we get to Jesus and the more we walk with him, the more we have his perspective, the more this becomes easier, the more we are able to walk through these times better. You know, just a few weeks ago, I had, I had one of my kids was sick. And, you know, I, I want to be like Florence Nightingale, you know. I want to be this wonderful nurse who brings ibuprofen and crackers and ice chips just at any, you know, possible time needed. And, and, and for the first couple days, I did pretty well. But day four, when the fever still was going on, I was starting to get mad at my husband because his life wasn't really being affected as much as mine was. Of course, it doesn't make sense for his life to be as affected as mine is. He has a very structured job, and mine is much more flexible. I mean, I was really having to rearrange my lunch date with my best friend, and he was having to work. So, like, but I wanted to be bitter. I wanted to be bitter. I wanted to be irritated. Meanwhile, my sweet daughter is miserable. And, and it's, you know, I, I'm supposed to be the selfless mother. But I, it was like I wanted to be selfish. It was this internal struggle. And we experienced this. Our faith is a fight. And if it is not a fight, you've got to ask yourself, am I committed and submitted as I should be to God? If there is not this internal struggle going on in you, you've got to ask yourself, am I living as I should? And then for some of us, I mean, what we will find, though, is that as we live our lives, as we get closer and closer to Jesus, as we submit more and more to the Father, we will find that it does get easier. And there is a peace that comes as we live that out. But what is the best hope of all this is the fact that just like Simeon and, and we are not alone in the waiting, we are also not alone in the struggle that happens as we live out this faith. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. This is the, oh, so good truth. He gets it. Jesus understands it. He chose to come as a baby and live the life as a human so that he would get it. He doesn't stand off and be like, oh my gosh, get it together. Oh, myself, get it together. No. He says, I will walk with you. I will help you. I will guide you. Walk with me. I am with you. God, Emmanuel, God with us. It wasn't that Jesus just came and was born to be with us during that little period of time. No, it began the time where he is with us all along the way. As we struggle with the conflicts with others, as we struggle with the conflict within ourselves, he is with us. And he gets it. He understands it. And he is not, the amazing thing about Christianity is that we serve a God who not only understands it and gets it, he's experienced pain. It is through his death that we have life. 
It is through his anguish that we have peace. It is through his wounds that we are healed. And because we can have his perspective, because we can draw close to him and ask him for his perspective, we can push through the pain too. Scripture says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross because he knew it would bring everything right again. Everything that he's been waiting for. He was willing to go through all of that for us, for you. You are not alone in the struggle. You are not alone in the waiting. And every part of this story points to the fact that God loves you so much, he did not leave you alone. He is Emmanuel. He is God with you. And this story shows us that he is a God who sees us and he is a God who fulfills promises. And so what I want to do now is I want us to bow our heads and I'm going to pray. So go ahead, bow your heads, and here's what I want you to do. While you're bowing your heads, I want you to think about the things in your life that you're either waiting on or you're in conflict over. And for those of you who are in those places, I want you to think about those things. Just close your eyes and think about those things. And for those of you who don't feel like you're in that spot, you're not really waiting, I want you to join me in praying for them, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you did not leave us alone. And Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would come and meet with those who are hurting, who are waiting, who are grieving, who are worried. And Father, I pray that by your Spirit, you would remind them that you are with them. Lord, I pray right now that you would put a picture inside their mind's eye of where you are with them in their waiting or in their struggle. I pray that you would show them where you are in that marriage or where you are in the doctor's office or where you are with that loved one who's doing God knows what. And Father, I pray that you would remind them of the hope that they have in you. Lord, that you would remind them that your timing is perfect. Lord, that you would renew their hope. That you would fill them once again with your spirit. Lord, that you would guide them and direct them in every situation that they have regarding whatever it is they're worried about or struggling with or waiting on. And I pray, Father God, that they would know you better because of it. That your presence and your peace would be so thick and so real. Thank you, God, that you are not one who has left us alone. Thank you for your love, your undeserved love. Lord, meet us here. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.